Welcome to our panel discussion, the prison industrial complex. We wish to thank Union Presbyterian Seminary, the Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation, and the Katie Geneva Cannon Center for Womanist Leadership for sponsoring today's forum. A few notes before we start. Only panelists will be speaking during the session. Use the chat feature to ask questions. This webinar is being recorded, so you can watch it again or share with others. Our panelists tonight are Dr. Reverend Dr. Nakia Smith Robert, pastor and founder of Reverend Daughter Ministries in Pasadena, California. Dr. Charlene Sinclair, founder and director of the Center for Race, Religion, and Economic Democracy. Reverend Linda Fox, Associate Minister at Trinity Baptist Church in Richmond, Virginia, and a volunteer chaplain at Virginia Correctional Center for Women in Goochland, Virginia. Our host and moderator is Dr. Rodney Sadler, Jr., Associate Professor of Bible and Director of the Seminary's Center for Social Justice and Reconciliation. Dr. Sadler, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much, Mike, for your wonderful introductions. I always appreciate hearing you uh, bring us into conversation. I'd like to welcome you all this evening to this conversation tonight on the prison industrial complex. And it is truly a timely conversation. You see, the incarceration of black bodies is not new. Many of us feel that it is an issue that is pertinent today as we've become aware of it recently because of the popularity of Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, or Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy, or Ava DuVernay's movie The 13th. Yet those rhetorists have simply shed light on a persistent problem for the larger African-American community. Even before the beginning of the Civil War, jails and prisons were used to house black bodies in America. Initially used to warehouse those commodified bodies preparing to be sold, they were subsequently employed to house renegade or escaped enslaved people, subsequently employed to house those arrested and re-enslaved based upon vagrancy laws in the post-Civil War period, and even later used to keep victims of the war on drugs that is actually a war on black and brown communities. African-American identity has long been associated with criminalization. In many respects, it is as being born in black and brown skin is itself a crime. But the notions of prisons isn't only a matter of incarceration and the commodification of human beings. It's also a matter of frightening statistics, like the one that says that one in nine African-American men currently are under the supervision of the criminal justice system, or one in three African-American males born since 2000 will spend some time of their life in jail. It's also a matter of voter suppression, as those who've been incarcerated are also often disenfranchised if they have felony records. It's also a matter of family cohesion, as those who've been incarcerated are pillars of families that have been removed, destabilizing those larger families. It is also a matter of economic viability for entire communities, as when you remove earners from a community, it destabilizes not just families, but the communities in which they live. So you see, the matter of mass incarceration of African Americans is an issue that deals with the fundamental survival of the Black community. Further, we would also be remiss in this conversation not to acknowledge that part of the Abrahamic faith traditions emphasized in Isaiah is to see that the captives are released. Or in books like Matthew, that we care for those who have been imprisoned. God's view of those that we often lock away, those whose futures we delimit and curtail, those who so often we forget about, is that we are to care for, to release, and to love them. That is why we are talking about this issue tonight. It is an issue in the popular sphere. It is an issue of consequence to the survival of black peoples. It is an issue near and dear to God's heart. And it is an issue of justice. 
If we are to be the kind of America that we say we are, we need to deal with these questions tonight. I'm incredibly happy to have the panel of witnesses that will come and testify tonight about what's going on with incarceration in America. I wanna start off tonight though with a question to the Reverend Dr. Nakia Smith-Robert. Dr. Smith-Robert, how does the American understanding of a punitive God contribute to the excesses of the carceral state in America? Thank you, Dr. Sattler. I want to uh, thank you for having me here and to uh, be with this esteemed panel of colleagues uh, to address this very important topic. Um, this is a good question. And, and let, me, let me say this. You are the first guest that has been on multiple times in the Just Talk, Talk, Just series. So I just wanted you to know that we love you and we are so appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. It's an honor. I appreciate it. Um, so it's a good question that you ask. Um, and, you know, there is a fetishization with punishment uh, within the American context that we also see reproduced in the church. A particularly religious document uh, doctrine such as sin and sacrifice. And we're seeing religious scholars increasingly talk more about this connection between uh, theological underpinnings or Christian interpretations of punishment as it relates to mass incarceration. So uh, one thinker that really informs my work is Mark Lewis Taylor in The Executed God, who talks about uh, American imperialism and how it creates this theaters of terror and liturgies of punishment uh, that are rooted in religious contradictions and undergird uh, the prison industrial complex. Some of those contradictions that we see are priests administering executions uh, in the 17th and 18th centuries. We see chaplains escorting prisoners to uh, death chambers. Even the architectural design of prisons uh, are rooted in uh, ecclesial designs. And of course, when we think about the root of penitentiary and its root in penitence, this idea that earth punishment predicted uh, eternal punishment. Um, so there are many connections between this American understanding of a punitive God in the carceral state. Uh, just quickly, Kelly Brown Douglas talks about American exceptionalism and the idea of white impunity and black guilty bodies also rooted in the religious context. And one person who's often overlooked is Rima Vesley Flad. Uh, she looks specifically at reform theologies, uh, Protestant work ethic and so forth that constructs dangerous and polluted bodies. And in my own work, um, I sp focus specifically on the ways in which religious values are used to undermine the moral agency of black women uh, based on societal perceptions of deviance that we also see uh, reproduced in the church. So. There's many connections and I, I won't share them all. I'm sure my colleagues would love to jump in. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh, again, a blessing to hear from you and always to hear what you bring to this larger conversation. Our next question goes to uh, the Reverend, uh, the Reverend Linda Fox. Linda, who is a not only a expert in this area, but also I'm so pleased to see one of our doctoral ministry students uh, participating in this conversation tonight because of your depth of understanding of what's going on, uh, particularly the way that women have been involved in this larger carceral state. I want to ask you just uh, to begin off, tell me a little bit about the way that uh, incarceration has impacted the Black family by incarcerating Black women. Oh, it's, it's devastating to see. For the past 10 or 12 years, I've been working with state prisons and of course city jails. And more recently, uh, since being in the doctoral poor, I'm working as a volunteer, but still maintaining my work with the uh, Virginia Correctional Center for Women. And I see it every day. And when we're looking at women, I see it as really being three tiers. First, you're looking at the woman and regardless of the circumstances or what happened, just being arrested, and being incarcerated is trauma. And most often, these women already have pre-existing trauma situations they're coming from. And oftentimes, these are spurred by desperation. So first of all, you've got the trauma that happens. Then secondly, you're disrupting the entire family. Whatever happens to one happens to all. And so you have the trauma and immediately, and it's not like, um, 
you put on your calendar, well, I'm going to jail tomorrow at 1015. It happens immediately. You can't prepare for it. You could be on your way to the store and the children are in the car. So it's just very traumatic. And then of these women uh, that are being incarcerated throughout the years, throughout this country, 80% of them are mothers. So they have children. And so then, the, and they're usually a single family. So they are the sole provider for the family. And it's just total disruption. So you first have just the woman who's been uh, arrested and incarcerated. Then you move to the child. And then that's the devastating part because the child, first of all, has to go through maternal separation. I mean, mom is gone. And it increases uh, the propensity for delinquency, mental health issues, uh, their education suffers. And usually as we look at our jails, we see that there's a lot of poverty. And so once this happened, they go from poverty, from poor to extreme poverty. And then they just set the trajectory for this child to now start to start that path of actually possibly being incarcerated themselves. So you got the first tier, this is a mother, the second tier is a child. And then sometimes we forget about the caregiver. That's another area. And so usually it's a grandmother or a grandparent. And if it's a grandparent, that's someone who's already done her childbearing and now she has this additional responsibility that she has to do. Number one, she or he or them or whatever the case may be, they're declining in their years. Health is an issue. Economics is an issue. And then you have just the idea that they're doing this sometimes out of what they feel is their obligation. But then also this residual, sometimes resentment. And so it's just a plethora of things that it just happens all across the field. But it's just one other thing that I, I just really, that has just really concerned me a lot. With the present administration, they've talked a lot about uh, the children at the border. And everybody across the country have been totally upset and needless, rightfully so. But I see that same separation of children from parents every weekend at the jails, every weekend. And I see toddlers crying because they're being separated from their mothers and they have no idea what's going on. I see mothers who are traumatized again because the child has been taken away or mothers who are having their babies while they're incarcerated and the child is taken away. So you can just see it's just something that we have to come up with better solutions and other ways to be able to deal with this. So I'm certain everybody else has lots of things that they can add to this, but it's just heart wrenching for me, heart wrenching. It certainly is heart wrenching. And I'm glad that you are able to do the work that you are to help families deal with that trauma and women who are incarcerated address this concern as well. Our next speaker is uh, a woman, Reverend Dr. Charlene Sinclair, who I knew long before you, Reverend Dr. Sinclair, you were an activist and I knew you as an organizer and a, an activist who was on the ground doing some significant work. But you are also a specialist in this larger area. What should faith communities do to increase sensitivity to the prison industrial complex? Uh, we all belong to these faith communities and this is an issue that's out there. What should we do as members of faith communities? Thank you so much. And yes, we have known each other for a long time, more years than I want to even state publicly. And it is so wonderful to be here with old friends and new friends. And so I'm delighted that we're having this conversation. I'm delighted that faith communities are having this conversation. And um, particularly since, you know, as a way to enter into a response to this question, I'd actually like to quote Michelle Alexander from her book, The New Jim Crow. And what Michelle talks about is that many faith communities actually operate with what she calls an eerie silence that in faith communities, rather than being places of refuge, we are places of judgment, of shame, and in contempt. And as a result of that, many people are in our communities and don't even express the trauma, the fear, the fact that they may have someone that is incarcerated and they're telling folks that they're off to school or they're in the army or they're no longer here. So we are not a place where we can come together as a community to be able to support each other and more um, critically to deal with this issue that is so devastating to our community. 
one of the first things that I think it's important for us to do as a faith community is actually to shed the notion that this is some theoethical moral individual question. This is actually a theoethical moral societal question. These are racialized structures of society that have actually for generations since our, our coming to this country have actually created all kinds of systems of discipline and punishment. Carceral systems that began with plantations that moved into prisons that became convict leasing that became in many cases, you know, welfare structures you know, ways of surveillance and capture. So we have this embedded history. And I do believe that one of the ways in which our faith communities can, can actually address this question is to pull away from the notion that somehow this is a moral failing of a person and ask the question, why as a society do we incarcerate so many people at such an astounding rate? And why as a society, if we do the analysis of the people we're incarcerating, we find that the pathway to incarceration is a pathway from poverty to jails. Why as a society, are we satisfied with having punishment be our first mechanism of relief or release? as opposed to how do we come together communally? I think if we return to our roots, our biblical roots, some of our theological roots and understand the movements of poor people that we call ourselves connected to, you know, and what those movements did in terms of facing those structural societal um, questions and creating new modalities, new realities and fighting for all people to have dignity and to be together communally, I think that we can find the first step to some of the answers in that place, rather than continuing to have, you know, this, this politics of silence and false respectability that forces people to hide, rather than to be in community where they can heal from the various traumas that, that folks have mentioned here. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate all of the uh, panelists weighing in initially, and now I want to open up a question for all of us to weigh in on. And I want to start with uh, a question that has occurred to me, particularly as you mentioned the notion of racialization uh, in this last that, that last uh, piece that you mentioned, Dr. Sinclair. What do you think is the role of race uh, in the mass incarceration of people in this nation? Would we be so predisposed to lock people away if the way that we think about people through a racialized lens was not there? And would we, uh, do we think that the way that the stereotype of blacks as criminally predisposed lends itself to uh, the perpetuation of the carceral state? Yeah, I, I believe that in my work, I look at structural racism and its relationship to capitalism and economic structures. And so it begins with an analysis around slavery and the utilization of the othering of individuals as a way in which we can actually justify the kind of harm that we are prepared to do. If you notice that, you know, let's take even some of the killings that we've experienced, the first thing that happens is not a society that grieves. It is a society that tries to craft a criminal out of yes. the, that that ha that person has been killed. Yeah. And you know that is not what happens when a person is a young white person. We you know we have the model of it when we see the young man from Illinois go into Wisconsin and kill three two people and wound one, and millions of dollars are, are paid to have him set free. You know, so some captives are set free, right? But then you have, you know, um, a young black woman gunned down in her bed and in the process of attempting to connect her to a drug trade and to connect her to some kind of behavior that people will think is criminal and therefore make her worthy of that kind of brutal death is a path that we as a society have allowed to happen. So it goes back to um, 
Orlando Patterson's work when he talks about slavery and social death. The, the way in which you enslave people, the way in which you will kill them, harm them, whether that is allowing children to be ripped from their mother's arms while the mothers are slammed in a prison cell or young kids to be put in a cage at the border. The way in which you do that is to create what he calls a natal alienation, a sense that we don't belong to each other. You know, this is a way in which our faith can actually be a pathway because the faith teaches us that, yes, we are our brothers and sisters keeper. We belong with each other. We are households upon households that are interconnected deeply. And so uh, I think that it is if we don't come to terms with the fact that this society is driven by the idea of an individual exceptional person that is somehow alienated from everyone else. And therefore, if you cannot be that person that looks a certain way that you are that other, then you become expendable by this society. So race does play a significant role in it. Uh, Dr. Smith Robert. Yeah, I, that, that's, that's rich, uh, Dr. Sinclair. I'll add that um, society functions according to these uh, hierarchical constructs. Um, race is one. If it wasn't race, it would be class. If it wasn't class, it would be gender. And it would be so. It's always uh, reproducing these markers to uh, exalt a privileged few and to marginalize everyone else. Um, and so, what we see with the evolution of punishment is it's uh, inception in slavery and how that evolved into other systems of punishment uh, that we've inherited, which is prisons. Um, and black and brown bodies are disproportionately impacted. Uh, why? Because in slavery, we were property. Um, and now it's the system always correcting itself, but not according to transformative and you know ideals, but degenerative ideals. So it corrects itself not by improving, but by punishing even more and finding new ways to do that. Um, and so prison is just another form of slaveocracy. It's another form uh, of systems of control uh, to make black bodies inferior. Um, so race absolutely is at the core. And I would argue intersectionally that there's other identifiers as well. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, and I've long thought that the uh, way that the system has worked has been to control wild blackness, this notion out there that blacks need to be controlled in some way. So thank you for lifting that point up. Reverend Fox. Yes. Um, in another life, I did a lot in marketing and advertising. And to me, this is just the most amazing marketing plan that I've ever seen in the way that they've marketed. And the thing that makes me so sad is that black folks are also complicit with the problem. And so when you talk about the church, what I have found really amazing out when I'm working at the center and, and working within my church is we share the statistics. I share them all the time and everyone is aghast and, oh yes, that's right, that's right. And then we can turn around and have a couple of people who've been incarcerated, who are returning to the church, and there is a measure of disdain. So my concern is getting all folks, getting the church to understand and to be educated as to what's really happening, to get your eyes open and to understand, and then to be what we say we preach. And that is to be accepting. So I look at number one is, find a way to lift the stigma. And I think it starts with the church. I think we have to find a way to teach our folks. They have a cadre of believers to get them to understand what that stigmatization is. What's been amazing to me is sometimes I've gone out and I've had opportunities to speak and to share about mass incarceration, particularly of women. And it's always the case. Afterwards, someone pulls me over in the corner and wants to share with me that, their brother, their mother, their sister. And these are not, uh, these are people who are well known in the community and hold positions of, of great respect. And yet they are victims of the stigmatization. They are victims of the shame. And so we've got to get past that. And then for the women themselves, I mean, who've been through so much trauma, my concern is getting them to a place where they just 
find a way to teach them what self-worth is. And then all of the other programs can happen after that. But until we can deal with the stigmatization and until we can deal with, in my opinion, the self-worth issue, we just have a lot to do, a long way to go. Thank you, Thank you for that. And uh, your, your last point raised an issue for me that uh, I, I don't think that we attend to as much as we should in society. We often talk about the mass incarceration of black men, but only recently has it been surfaced that African-American women are not only uh, incarcerated at a much higher rate than their rate in the population, but that there's an increasing amount of African-American women who are being incarcerated. Can we, uh, the three of you, if you'd like to deal with that a little bit for a moment, I'd love to hear us lift up this as a concern, the incarceration of African-American women. It's, it's for me, I find it, I mean, I see it every day. It's a grave concern of African-American women that I see coming through the doors every Monday. Um, I go and I meet them, uh, the new group that comes in and just share with them what available and how can I help and those kinds of things. But the other alarming thing that I'm finding is it's just not only are I'm seeing young African-American women, I'm seeing grandmothers, I'm seeing elders. And that is alarming to me. And also to just seeing, hearing the stories um, as to why they're there. Maybe it's because, and oftentimes it's because of poor choices in relationships and not necessarily for something that they've done. But I wanna go back just to another issue that we talked about earlier when I think about the children. Most of these women that I have experienced, that I've seen, it's usually drug charge or something like that. Nevertheless, with a drug charge, small or great, they're gonna be away from their children on an average of seven to seven and a half years. And that's devastating. Um, I, I, Sometimes I just get lost for words and just get overwhelmed by the whole idea of what I see on a daily basis. Yeah, I'll jump in if if that's okay with you, Dr. Sattler. Okay, um, so my work largely deals with um, the criminalization of black women, particularly black mothers who break the law to survive, to provide for themselves and their children. And I think, uh, one metric that we don't highlight enough are these survival crimes. Yes, a large portion of women who are incarcerated um, have been abused, have uh, had some connection to drug violations, uh, but there's this also the, the mothers who are stealing diapers, right? Who are stealing Similac food to feed their babies. Um, and I think that there is a grave injustice when we criminalize poor black mothers for merely trying to survive and to survive in a system that's stacked up against them, right? So, um, and, and uh, Reverend Linda, you've mentioned the consequences that occur when, when mothers are taken out of the home and incarcerated. Um, so I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think up until 2015 is when we saw uh, women being the uh, largest population um, that had the highest rates of incarceration and that declined after 2015. Uh, but there's other things to say about that, right? It's not just uh, a statistic, but these is this is the impact of of, of women, but also the larger system that Sinclair, uh, Dr. Sinclair was talking about. I'm sorry, I know you affectionately, so I'm... <laughs> um, and, and so, so I, I, I do want to emphasize uh, women, but I also want to draw attention to this larger system that rather than provide the resources that these mothers need to survive, our first response is criminalization and punishment. And that's a moral failure of our society. Um, and I, I mean, there's so much more we could say, but I'm going to stay within my time limit. I'd like to add, now you, you just don't open this question up with women and don't expect all women to comment. Right. <laughs> so what I'd also like to add though, is um, the work of Louis Wakant that really looks at the gender nature of the carceral structure. And what his work shows is that we cannot only think of a carceral structure from the point of imprisonment in cells or in cages. For women, that control and surveillance mechanism is tied deeply to their poverty. It's tied through 
yes. WIC. It's tied to yes. former welfare structures, et cetera. So the, the entire ways in which women, poor women, have had to deal with their very bodies, even to this day, their very bodies being surveilled and controlled is similar to the level of carceral control that is replicated within structures of prisons. The other piece, too, is that, you know, that I don't want, I thank you both, Reverend Linda, Dr. Nakia, for raising the issue around poverty and violence against women. Because if you track the stories of women, you are tracking stories of extreme violence and poverty. And you're talking about Black women who before the age of 18 have experienced some level of sexual yes. or physical violence, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly so, oh, well over 80% of Black women have experienced some level of violence. And you know, I go back to Reverend Linda's comment about marketing. The fact of the matter is we do see this increased number of women being imprisoned. And, you know, we see an increased number of white women as a result of the opioid epidemic. Yes. You know, so whereas you Black women didn't know how to take care of themselves. Black women didn't know how to take care of their kids. Black women were criminals. Then we see very similar to, um, oh, what, what is the book, Condemnation of Blackness that Khalil Gibran Muhammad wrote when he talked about the systematic way in which poverty as seen through the lens of whiteness was something that needed to be dealt with through programs, through support, through assistance. Whereas through the lens of looking at black poverty, it is something that is on the verge of criminality, is some kind of pathology, it's a degradation of the human being and it needs to be controlled. And so we're seeing this play out now with women where black women are being incarcerated due to what is their quote unquote pathology, whereas white women who have opioid addictions now need support. Amen. Can I just jump in yes. there? This is please, such please, a good please, question. Please, 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 please go ahead. <laughs> and and just, just to connect the dots with what Reverend Linda was saying in terms of the marketing scheme, right? There is the societal perception of black women as deviant, right? As a social aberration, promiscuous, cheaters, right? Welfare queen. So there is the societal perception um, that we see, of, of course, evolve historically, right? Um, of black women as bad mothers, as as bad as as immoral um, and deviant, um, and so those controlling images absolutely impact uh, policies that have consequences, punitive consequences for black women. Yeah. Um, and we see that in the welfare reform. We see that with the welfare queen, right? The ways in which welfare reform was used. Uh, to surveil women and black mothers in the home. Um, and because they were perceived as cheaters, right? They needed extra hyper uh, surveillance and were uh, consequent, consequently criminalized. Also, these controlling images and societal perceptions we saw in a study between crack mothers and, co and white cocaine mothers, right? You would see, I, I forget the numbers, but you would see um, the news um, have higher coverage, greater coverage of black crack mothers shown, you know, actually using, administering the drugs with their baby in hand, right? And you had cocaine, white cocaine mothers who were depicted as uh, rehabilitating, um, good mothers, helpless. Um, so absolutely, these these narratives, these controlling images impact the ways in which Black women are punished. And Dr. Sinclair, you raise a good point in terms of these punitive disparities, right? We see that with Kelly Williams Bolar and uh, the admission scandal, uh, Black women are punished more egregiously uh, than, than white women. And so uh, these are all things that contribute to um, the criminalization of Black women and why we need to talk about it more. Amen. Thank you. Reverend Fox, do you want to jump in? You know, I was just listening. All of these are such marvelous, valid points. But I was also thinking about, I, I keep going back to what I see day to day. And I think about Black women and how they're given, how they set up a system in our jail systems and in our prisons. 
as to give them benefits for good behavior. What connotes good behavior? And if you have good behavior, and I'll give you an example of uh, the facility where I am, um, they're supposed to be or have been considered sort of state of art for the country. Uh, they're minimum security and it's a facility that uh, is very picturesque, it probably looks like a community college campus. You see no fences, you see no barbed wire, none of that except the gate that you go through. And I was told when I looked at the history that there was a time, I believe back in the 70s, where women were allowed, if they had children, for the children to come and stay with them while they were incarcerated. I believe up until the age of two. Now there's some consideration of doing that again, but it's, you get to have your child with you if you have good behavior. And it's just something that's very, very wrong about that because what we're doing is, it's sort of like the, the narrative we heard about uh, the children at the border. Well, the children are being punished because the parents should know that they should not try to get into the country. So this is what happens to your children. So we look at the women in prison. Well, you can't see your children. Your children can't see you because you should have known better. You should have done, but if you're in good behavior and you know good behavior can mean a lot of different things when you're in jail. So if you're in good behavior, we may let you see your child. And yet there are no studies talk that we're looking at what happens to that child being born in. There's just gotta be a better way. It's gotta be a better way in terms of thinking about when a mother, for whatever the reason, needs to be incarcerated and their children I mean, we've done everything else. We can't figure that out. There's something wrong with this picture. Very wrong. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for this. And as the more you're talking about it, the, the question that comes back to me now, uh, we've talked about the criminalization of blackness, that blackness is in the larger society criminalized, denigrated, and I use that term intentionally, uh, and uh, thought to be something lesser than. Uh, talk about the criminalization of poverty and the way that this contributes to mass incarceration as well. The problem is that poverty and blackness are so intertwined, right? Not only that black people are, are overwhelmingly, you know, um, struggling around class, but regardless of whether you're struggling around class in the psyche of society, blackness, poverty, and criminality are so intertwined that it's hard to even pry them apart. You know, I've been doing a lot of um, work around, you know, like uh, diversity, equity, inclusion stuff has become the buzzword now. And I've even gone into whether they're corporations or schools where we're, we're talking about um, race. And the assumption is that everybody there is poor, even if they're not, you, because the in the psyche, poverty and blackness is so deeply intertwined. So that's one piece. But the other thing too is that you know we're we're all hearkening back to enslavement, where poverty and blackness were definitely intertwined. Right? It's like the building, the economic foundations of this country was actually built on the, the ability of, of landowners to have people that were kept impoverished and made to do all kinds of menial work. The, this country was built on a slaveocracy that actually extracted the labor, the value of human beings and said that we are going to use every sinew, every single piece of you even in death, to formulate the economic structures of this country. Our entire system is built on destroying Black people by the very creation of an otherness that is both, as you said, denigrated, but yet necessary for the, the economic advancement of this country. Even our debt system is based on that. You know, your very body is used to actually mortgage for land, for other slaves, for other property, for your tools, et cetera. So, so we have this relationship of economy and blackness that is deeply intertwined. 
And we also have this relationship between economic advancement in this country that is built on this false notion of a rugged individualism that is creating that and the fact that we must have somehow a society where the only way you're advancing is if you're a good person. Whereas we know that the only way any of this happens is if we have an engaged governmental structure that creates the regulatory processes to make that happen. Enslavement wasn't about just one white person hating a black person. It was actually about governmental regulations and laws and policies that upholded that. So the relationship between economy, economic development, blackness, the rise of capitalism, industrialism in this country is so deeply intertwined and relies on the fact that we have people that must work for subsistence or must work for subsistence either because they will be disciplined and killed or they are so disciplined through their very lack of having anything. This is the foundational nature of this country. And so, you know, it's hard to pull these things apart. And I don't think that we can actually get to the heart of any of this if we don't recognize the role that capital in capitalism, labor plays in the determination of these structures. Anybody else want to jump in on this before we move on? I, yeah, I'm, I'm right uh, with you, Dr. Sinclair. I think mm -hmm. um, the criminalization of poverty reveals a lot about America's value system, right? Um, the ways in which uh, wealthy, privileged individuals are rewarded and uh, those who are poor, everyone else is punished. Um, and so the very nature of, of criminalization is steep in this value system that is highly capitalistic. Um, so I, I, and, you know, I mentioned that the mothers who are you know, stealing diapers and, and milk and food to feed their families and the injustice, the moral failure that they're punished without the resources to survive, right? Um, but uh, Dr. Sattler, if it's okay, I, I would also mention the, bail, the bailing system here. Um, and so I think of Khalif Browder, God bless his soul, who was uh, I believe 16, 16 years old, uh, when he was uh, detained for allegedly stealing a backpack uh, and was waiting for trial for uh, three or four years, two of them in solitary confinement because he could not post bail. Um, so when we think about criminalization of poverty, there's a large amount of uh, the population of people who are incarcerated who are there just waiting for trial, right? They're not even uh, convicted as guilty, just waiting for trial. Um, and so that's that's a moral failure. I had some stats here that said uh, two out of three people are in jail awaiting trial. Five out of six are in jail because they could not afford bail um, or the bail agent declined to post. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what can churches do about that, right? Like I'm not just here to uh, to tell you how grim it is, but what can we do? Um, I would suggest that churches can donate some of their tithes and offerings to bail funds, right? Particularly for, uh, you know, for my research, mothers, right? Um, so there's many ways that you, I think about Raphael Warnock, right? Who's running for U.S. Senate, get out and vote. That's a shameless plug. Um, but his church um, had a huge uh, bailout initiative and uh, expungement seminar. So there are churches that are doing the work, but these unfortunately are exceptions and can do more to respond to the criminalization of poverty. Yeah. Thank you. Can uh, I add to that? Because I think that there, I'm just so glad that you mentioned that. And as an organizer, you know, I'm, I'm also one that says these structures do transform themselves if we don't destroy them. And so, you know, you have structures of direct imprisonment, you have jails and bails, and now you have, you know, huge systems that are being built up around ankle bracelets. You have folks that are having to pay for their own probation or their own parole 
or you know fines and fees that are preventing people from actually returning and voting there is a massive structure that continues to morph and build to the point in which you know it's like okay we will release the captives but what are we releasing them to you know, what does that actually mean? Are we releasing them, as you said, um, Dr. Nikki, are we releasing them into a society where we have morally reshaped it in the interest of human thriving? Or are we releasing them into a society that continues to build more and more structures on that very vessel of wrath and punishment? And I think that, you know, as churches, as people, as people of faith, we have to ask ourselves those questions and, mm -hmm. and figure it out. And, and I agree that we absolutely have got to try to, you know, bail folks out and have bail funds, et cetera. And, and I'm in a lot of churches though, where people will do that and they will not fight for a Raphael Warnock. They will not fight to mm -hmm. capture the Senate to ensure that we don't have a Mitch McConnell as the grim reaper. They will not put a COVID plan in place. And we don't even understand that the ability to refuse that mm -hmm. is based on this very system that we're talking about, yes. right? Everything that we're talking about is actually reaping a society that says it is okay for you to get sick. It is okay for you to die. It is okay for you not to be able to feed your family, for you not to have rent. We are, we are talking about building up that very same society. And if we don't think that these things are interconnected yeah. and a Raphael Warnock and a John Ossoff makes a difference, and we think that all we got to do is, you know, kind of pray a little bit and tithe a little bit, then, yeah. you know, I'm scared for my grandkids. Thank you. Thank and, you. and not only are they connected, yeah. but I think something else that's very important, what you're saying is how high the stakes are mm -hmm. for the church to redress. Yep the ways in which they co-opt these punitive mechanisms, mm -hmm. right? We are participating in this logic. Mm -hmm. And it's it's imperative that we think of new ways to dismantle the system, right? right? right. Um, yeah. I, I love, love the fact that you've talked about this sort of intersectionality here too, that uh, it's not just one issue. Even if we solved uh, mass incarceration tomorrow, uh, the fact that this larger system expresses much the same kinds of uh, uh, devastating, uh, social controlling, uh, oppressive behavior means that we're letting people back out into a system that is equally corrosive and equally damaging. Thank you for raising uh, that as a concern. Linda? Yeah, exactly. And and that's where I'm spending a lot of time working because my concern is in re-entry. Mm -hmm. And I'm very concerned and, and all of these things and I talk all the time about what needs to be done and what needs to happen and, and that's all well and good. But I'm also very much more concerned about what are we going to do right now? And what are we going to do now with the women who are preparing to come out in another year, two years? And then what are we going to do? And unfortunately, there are programs <clears throat> that help them while they're in. There are some that help them while they're out. But there's very little that bridges the two. And the ones that I have found that have been most successful are directed toward men and not women. So my concern has been putting together a reentry program that prepares women to give them the tools, to give them the disciplines, to give them the support that they need. And support is key. And that's where the church comes in. Not just talking, not just praying, not just tithing, but put your money where your mouth is and be there. You know, when a, and it's very practical. They're very practical things that you can do. I mean, when someone, a woman, met anyone, and they've just come out of jail, they're just some practical things. If they've been in there for seven years, they don't know how to use a smartphone. They're not familiar with mass transit and they need help. Someone in the church can help them to navigate the system, to tell them what to do going forward. So um, I'm very concerned about what I can do now, even within the framework, even within the constraints of what the system has how can we work it? How can we maneuver it? And what I've been looking at too are uh, entrepreneurship programs for those who are in re-entry. So. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I, I want to take one of the questions from uh, our audience. The first question that came in from our audience had to do with 
uh, from Garrett Combs had to do with the black church as an organ for community uh, development. And if you think about the black church historically, we've celebrated the fact that the black church was uh, involved early on helping people to be free. Uh, the black church was involved in the civil rights movement. We think about it in that way. Uh, we think about in the, the 1970s through the, the 90s, the black church in community redevelopment, uh, building housing in, in the community, et cetera, et cetera. But why is it that the black church has not taken a larger a role in addressing this issue of mass incarceration that is so significant to the community. I, I've heard hints from uh, Dr. Rob, uh, Smith Robert talking about uh, the fact that we've bought into another narrative. Uh, but what's going on and how do we wake up this sleeping giant to begin to address this concern? I think it's just a simple matter of education. I think they need to know. Mm -hmm. um, I have found that when I'm sharing the statistics, you know, it's as though a light bulb goes on with those whom I share when I go from church to church or community groups or whatever. But somehow there needs to be a creative way of getting them to connect the dots. We have the statistics here. Yes, that's horrible. Yes, we have here. This is what you can do. Now let's connect the dots. Where's the action? Where does the rubber meet the road? What are we going to do in putting together an action plan? And I think I'm, we're the ones, the women who are, you know, in this panel. I mean, we're shouting and screaming and giving the information out. But I think it has a lot to do with just educating those in the black church to be sensitized to what's happening and to understand, for lack of a better word, how they've been duped. Yeah, I agree. Uh Reverend Linda, I think it is a reconditioning that needs to happen in our theologies and our ecclesiologies and our belief system. Um, I think it begins with um, our understanding for the Christian context of who Jesus is, right? And who Jesus was in proximity to criminality. Um, and so Jesus was a prisoner, right? Um, Jesus died a criminal's death. Um, and so I think it's, it's reconditioning ourselves to see how central uh, the problem of punishment is and Jesus's advocacy for those who possess a criminal element. Um, so one, it's, it's, it's rethinking our understanding of Jesus, right? Um, and our reading of scripture. Um, and, and, you know, we know, we know, right? We know Matthew 25, as, oft, as often as you've done it for the least of these, including visiting the, those who are imprisoned, you've done it for me. So it's a requirement of discipleship. Um, so that's one thing. And then it's also um, debunking the stigmatization that happens with criminality. I won't call the church, uh, but I was serving a church and I asked my pastor at the time, um, as the chair of the Social Action Commission, can we have an auxiliary that is solely committed to the work of prison abolition? And that pastor said, I don't wanna deal with that population because it's like opening up a can of worms, right? Um, and so I finally moved that conversation along. I got the auxiliary and I had eight different tables of committees people would disperse and go to the cause they wanted to support. At the table for prison abolition, not one person sat there. And when I asked why, it was this notion of stigma. And so we have to rethink that. Um, and I think the way we do that is understanding that it, it, it implicates us all. We all know someone who uh, was, was system impacted. And we have all been condemned, right? We are all sinners. We have all fallen short. Um, and so it, this is a pervasive problem, but it's everyone's problem. And um, so I think it's those different ways of reframing and re-entering the conversation of criminalization that can help the church to move forward and lead in that type of engagement. Yeah. And I think um, if I may also, um, Having been at Union Theologicals, the other union, the New York Union, and um, worked and trained with Dr. James Cone, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this very tension has, has always been a tension 
in the black church, this tension around a uh, black theology that is both black church and black power. And this is the this is the place where we have have at moments found a sweet spot, but have not been able to uphold that and marry them into a movement that is powerful enough to shift real fundamental change. And I, I think that this is, you know, we can we can do many things, but you know, if we look at the work of James Cone. There are a couple of things that we need to do. One is exactly what um, Dr. Nakia talked about. The, a black theology requires an acceptance, uh, uh, a praising. We need to praise dance blackness. You know, we need to to be clear about the fact that that we are all we mm. need. Our very being is mm. where God resides. You know, yeah. and it's that it's we it. also need the power to deal with the fundamental issues that prevent black life from thriving. And I think part of what we tend to come up against is that what we put forth as somehow um, blackness or black church is really our desire to capture whiteness and a white life. And that's where we tend to come, we clash because we are so busy trying to replicate that which we are taught is the best, mm. which is the whiteness and the white life that we don't understand how to actually sit in our own power and amass that power towards a fundamental societal shift. Even when we see it, we still don't want to hold it. Yeah. You know, even when we see it, we don't want to hold it. Yeah. I just want to say, I see the spirit of cone descend upon you. <laughs> I'm just going to say, I'm sorry, but I have to say amen. 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 We'll be sorry to say amen. Keep on saying it. <laughs> amen. Because, and, yeah. and one of the things, too, that um, when I'm working in the, in the uh, jails and prisons, mm -hmm. I feel that as a church, certainly we need to go and there are things, but we need to prepare our folks. We need to train them. Because so many of them who are on fire and say, yes, I do. I want to go. I want to do the prison ministry. I want to do the jails. They turn into nothing but Bible thumpers. That's all they are. They want to go in and, 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 and just quote the text that they've heard since they were five years old. And it's not applicable. And they're not interpreting it through the eyes. We have to train people to be able to understand, to look at the text and look at it through the lens of those who are incarcerated. I tell them in jails all the time. I said, listen, you guys, you're in good company. And it begins with Jesus. Amen. And one of the things that you said is that, and what I try to, and this is why I talk so much about getting into the field of sense of self-worth is knowing that you are enough. You are more than enough, sister. And getting them to recognize that they have to have that to move forward. Otherwise, they'll just keep doing it over and over and over again. And there are many in our church that they haven't arrived at that either. So it's a big work to be done in the church. They say you have to get your act together before you take it on the road. Ooh. And I think the church needs to get its act together. And I'm not saying that... Uh, as a cynic, we have to be trained. We have to be prepared. We need to know, just like when we do missionaries, we prepare missionaries before we go to another country so we won't offend. Mm -hmm. But we need to prepare our church so that when we go, we know what we're talking about and we're there to help, like the Holy Spirit, to come alongside and help and not hinder. Because sometimes our best intentions are nothing but hindrances. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That was a, a wonderful... Uh, critique, and I think I got the, the the church needs to wake up and recognize the role of black theology as fundamental for transforming uh, the way that we address larger social issues. If we paid attention to black theology, perhaps it would not be so strange for us to think of these issues as fundamental to the work that we do. Uh, so grateful for that. Uh, one of the things I've often heard when we talk about uh, mass incarceration is that the majority of people incarcerated are incarcerated for nonviolent drug offenses. Uh, we watched what happened in the, the 80s and 90s through the crack wars, and uh, this was criminalized to a much greater extent than cocaine, powdered cocaine was. Uh, we now see the uh, opioid epidemic, the meth, uh, uh, methamphetamine uh, wars are going on as it were, uh, but uh, the, the strategy seems to have shifted in as much as this primarily deals with those who are in white skin, 
uh, we've talked about therapy and treatment uh, in this. So a question that comes from one of our audience members, uh, Sabri Napier, has to do with this notion of uh, what to what extent is the uh, increasing number of African-American women in prison a result of dealing with uh, drugs and drug addiction and drug offenses? A great portion of it is. Uh, and I would say the majority of it is, is dealing with drug offenses. Another thing that we talked about is a lot of the things we talked about, uh, uh, Reverend Akia Booth, about stealing diapers, it's, it's, it's out of a sense of desperation that brings them there. And um, nothing that would warrant the sentences that they get. And, and it's, it's just devastating. devastating. I think no one wakes up and says, I want to go and spend 20 years in Absolutely prison. Not. Like no one does that. And so, you know, I think that we tend to begin and and move forward from that moment rather than to actually utilize the um, the experiences of people as as um, Dr. Nakia said and, and, Doc, and Reverend Linda said, what are we learning about society? from the experience of people that are incarcerated. What must we do? What are they telling us? You know, this is the other other piece that we have to um, get a grip on is that, that we don't know everything. And people that are incarcerated actually have experiences yes. that are a lens to the problems, the fault lines within society. And if we were to, but to engage in their lives authentically, and truthfully, and to see where those where those experiences are not from a place of judgment, not from a savior mentality, but from a place of you are a child of God. And if you are here, then society did something wrong. So let's figure this out. What happened? And then what must we fix in society? Not what must we fix in you? You know, so I think that it is really, you know, I think we need to, 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 to say, do we really believe that every human being is, you know, by nature, a God awful sinner that is going to end up in prison? And so if we believe that, that's one thing. But if we don't believe that, then we need to be asking different questions. We need to have a different lens. We need to be, you know, we need to go behind the veil. As Du Bois said, we need to understand, you know, what is society and then what are the folks that have been required to live in that society? What do they do to actually survive in it? And what does that tell us about, as you said, Dr. Nakia, what does that tell us about what we value? What does that tell us about the morality of this society? And are we comfortable with that? Or do we need to do something to change it? Yeah, I would I would agree with what both of you said, um, and I think also not Dr. Sinclair, you said uh, not fixing something in you, but fixing society. I think um, we have to think about uh, what infrastructure can we put in place mm -hmm. to restore people yes. to the image of God and to full citizenship, right? Um, and the image of God piece, I would argue that that's the role of the church, right? How do we rethink these yeah. doctrines of sin and sacrifice and cultures of respectability that shame and judge and condemn uh, women who transgress the boundaries of these uh, attitudes, right, and rules, similar to the ways in which they are criminalized by society for breaking uh, or contravening law? the law. Um, and so my push there would be a move to transformative justice. It would be ultimately to make re-entry obsolete. Yes. Right? That we would no longer be having that conversation because there would no longer be prisons for people to re-enter society from. Mm -hmm. And so I want to think about how can we reimagine society so that there are infrastructure and communities in place mm -hmm. to restore people when there has been some type of breach in, in the contract. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you so much. So we have a question that comes in, uh, and it's actually a question that ends with a statement that seems to answer itself, but I want us to react to it because I think it's a significant question. Uh, Don Moses says, uh, so then what is the true cost of imprisoning people of color 
in comparison to the social programs and education needed to rehabilitate them. It seems that we are putting our tax dollars in the wrong place. Absolutely. Go ahead, Dr. Nakia. No, go. You go for it, I'm, Dr. Sinclair. Go ahead. Um, I would I, I simply, I would just say the cost of incarcerating far exceeds um, the benefit of having infrastructure and programs and social safety nets in place so that people have access to opportunity and resources to thrive. Uh, there's just collateral consequences, a Pandora box of of harms that are caused when people's when people's rights are stripped away and they are caged. We've seen in our discussion how families are impacted, communities are impacted, individuals are impacted, our economy is impacted. It's costly to incarcerate, um, and so you know it, it affects our budget, our fiscal budget as a country. And so, simply, I would just say. Uh, that the harms caused by incarcerating far exceeds the benefits of helping to transform someone's life so that they can thrive. Yeah, and I would add, it is, as you said, literally a budget gap. You know, the monies that are in place to uphold carceral systems are monies that are taken away from schools. You know, we would, we would, um, create prisons before we create mental health institutions. We create prisons before we pay teachers. We, you know, it's a lot of people are having um, a bunch of conversations around the call for defunding the police. But that is in essence what it is. It is a prison abolitionist statement that says there are ways in which our society is better served by putting our resources towards what is about human thriving as opposed to putting it towards a control. And, um, you know, you, you had made a statement, um, Dr. Rodney, uh, about nonviolent um, drug offenses. And, you know, as a, also as a prison abolitionist, you know, I, I'll push back on that a little bit because we believe that prisons, period, should be obsolete. And, and so then folks will ask, you know, so what about, you know, violent crimes? And then again, you have to ask yourself, how did that person get there? You know, what was the pathway to that? And what you'll find is most of the pathway is a pathway through mental illness. So is it life imprisonment or execution? Or is it that we failed by not having the right kind of infrastructure to deal with levels of mental illness. You know, prisons have become mental health hospitals. They are the places that are capturing people rather than providing the kind of services that are needed for folks to actually be able to live healthy lives. And so, you know, the, the cost is both the, the literal cost in budgets and the cost are the cost in families and communities. It's uh, the cost in generations because of the children and the impact of the children. It's the foster care system. You know, the, the, I mean, it, the rippling cost of this would make one wonder why are we still having this debate? Because the costs are so high. I would add that the cost is also death, right? We see that in times where police respond to a someone in a mental health crisis, uh, it can uh, resort to death. Uh, we saw that with Michelle Shirley um, and countless other, I believe Corinne Gaines might have had um, a mental health crisis. And so that's a period for me. And needless to say, we still cannot forget the capitalistic component. It's all about making the money and getting the return. And as was said earlier, when we were thinking about the church. This is a catchphrase, I guess it was in the nineties or whatever, going back to basics. And I think the church has to go back to basics and just understanding who is this Christ that we serve and what does it really mean to love others as we love ourselves? You know, what does it really mean? And are you really prepared to pay the cost to do that beyond the tax dollars, but in 
your ability, in your being, who you are, are you prepared to pay that cost? And um, it's a collective and it's also an individual question that has to be answered. Thank you. Thank you all so much for wrestling with that. Uh, and I'm sure there's so many ways that we could retask. Uh, a nation's budget really shows what their ethics are, what their character is. I mean, if we retask the way that we thought about these issues, uh, put our money where it could do the most good, we might have a much more just society. Uh, right now, I'm thinking about the fact that we just came off one of the most significant elections in our history. Uh, more than 80 million people voted for the person who won the election. Uh, 73 million voted for the person who lost the presidential election. That's more than 153 million people voting for a candidate in American, uh, for American presidency. But what shocks me in the midst of all this is the fact that so many African-American people cannot participate, they cannot vote because they've been incarcerated, uh, because they've had a felony conviction and their rights to vote have been taken away. It's always struck me as kind of odd. Why would you take a person's right to vote away for a criminal offense? It doesn't, there's no correlation there. They're gonna vote illegally? Uh, what is the, the, the issue that's there? So I'd love for you for a moment to talk about, uh, do you believe that the, uh, that the reason people's rights to vote are taken away is also a mode of social control uh, to particularly impact the African-American community and other uh, other minoritized communities. Uh, speak a little bit on that, please. Well, very briefly, absolutely. It's definitely about control. Uh, taking away the right to vote, then also once you are final release, they take away your opportunity or right to run for office. It takes the community's voting power away. And then even when you look at census, when they do the census count and you're incarcerated, those who are incarcerated are, are counted, but they are attributed to the area where they are incarcerated. So that means that in some rural place, which is not their community, even if they did that, they, they have no vote, but yet their number, their body count is attributed to an area that they have no allegiance or anything like that. Then of course, when we look at uh, those who are in jail, we, we're not considering them in the unemployment numbers. If we were to include them in the unemployment numbers, well, it would be staggering. Yeah. And so we just, and, and just the impact on, on the community. Um, we find that lots of times those who are incarcerated are clustered in given communities. So that entire community suffers in terms of having a voice and having, uh, being able to be part of the civic dialogue. So um, absolutely, it's all by design. And because, I mean, we've even seen as of late when uh, here, even in Virginia, when they were trying to uh, give those who incarcerated their rights back once they were released. Well, uh, in one state they said that, yeah, well, that's fine. They can have their rights, but they have to pay all their fines first. So again, it comes right back to the poverty issue. And jails were bit, built, I believe, because we want to, it's sort of like the bad part of town. People never want to drive through there. So those who they consider to be in the bad part of town, we put them in jail so we don't have to see them for the poor. Yeah, I think that um, you know, I currently uh, work with an organization called Black Pack. And um, Black Pack is designed specifically to build Black political power. And so engages in um, electoral work as well as organizing. And one of the things that, that we do is we also do political education. And a part of the political education is really showing the history of voter mm -hmm. suppression. Right. And so this is another mechanism of voter suppression. There is no reason why uh, anyone that has gone to prison, even if they're in prison, there's no reason why they should not have a stake in society, like a stake in saying, you know, what democracy could or should look like. Right. We make those determinations. You know, we've we've decided what constitutes a crime. We've decided, you know, what constitutes full return or not full return. Like we, we as a community, as a society have determined that. And it's always been that the way to maintain control is to exert control, 
right? And so the way you keep control in a small number of hands to structure wealth and structure, you know, a society that 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 continues to grow wealth in, in particular hands in particular ways is to make sure that you keep another set of people as detached from that process as possible, as detached from democracy as possible. And so the the goal to suppress participation of black people have been since right after the civil civil war. I mean the biggest question was not just um what would the 13th Amendment be? It would be, you know, do we give them political rights also? And does freedom constitute political rights? And recognizing that freedom does, you know, because you have to have the political power to claim it, to, to, to have it, to keep it, to formulate what you need with it. The best way to engage is to make sure as little people participate as possible. And so this process of keeping folks out is, a, is another voter suppression process. And it is made easier because of the stigmatization of, you know, quote unquote criminality. And I say quote unquote, because that's that's fluid also. Mm -hmm. I like to tell people Queen Victoria did coke. It is fluid. So who, yeah. Amen. You amen in the Queen Victoria did coke. <laughs> well, yes, I made money that she did come, and that she was able to have a, a, a life that was productive in spite of that fact, that she was not incarcerated because of that. Uh, so many, unfortunately, Amen, brother. black and brown women are incarcerated for that same thing. That's right. I'm amen. Amen, brother. <laughs> uh, so, Dr. Sattler, I think the number you gave was close to 153 million Yes. Uh, people voted in this election. Uh, so just to add some perspective to that, um, I've seen a number around 5 million of Americans who are disenfranchised uh, due to a felony conviction. Um, I think about three fourths of those people are no longer incarcerated. Um, so when you think about what does it mean to serve your time? That's one thing, right? What does it mean to serve your time and to then, and this goes back to Dr. Sinclair's point, to be released into a system that continues to uh, impede your ability to thrive and to reclaim full citizenship. And voter suppression through felony disenfranchisement is one way to do that. Um, and it's, it's a historical, uh, mechanism or historical device because uh, we've seen how testing was a requirement to vote at one at one point, right? Uh, and so that's a literary re requirement where some people don't have access to education uh, who aren't learned and have the ability to take that test. And so they're locked out of, um, of exercising a fundamental right to vote. Um, so it's a it's a huge um, injustice, and I think about I think about um, a woman named Demetrius Coonrod um, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and she and she, her story pretty much uh, embodies the entire conversation of the systemic ways in which criminalization impacts poor. Uh, poor black mothers. And I won't tell, get into the, the details of her story, but she grew up in uh, concentrated poverty. She went to schools that, uh, where she was so poor that she was constantly on a list where teachers would have to give her emergency uh, clothing uh, so that she would be presentable to school and emergency food so that her and her siblings could eat. She was incarcerated for trying to, um, for trying to find uh, the means to survive, which included uh, selling drugs and other uh, uh, and other infractions, um, but my point is this: after she served her time, she aspired to run for public office, and she was unable to do so because of the web of consequences that happens when you are incarcerated. She had fees that she could not afford to pay. She had um, she was her her voting rights were revoked because of felony disenfranchised. She petitioned the court, um, and she got her vote her voting reinstated. And with that, she ran for office, I believe it was councilwoman, and won. 
My point is this, when we give people access to resources and opportunity, it is more likely that people who were system impacted would do good with the opportunity, who would contribute. I wanna move away from the narrative of good, but who would contribute uh, to society um, that they would not otherwise be able to do if they were entrapped in this system and their rights stripped away, including that of voting. Amen, amen. Uh, as I listen to you all talk, I'm struck by a quote uh, from Victor Hugo uh, years ago that seems to come back to me now. If a soul is left in darkness, sins will be committed. The guilty one is not the one who commits the sin, but the one who causes the darkness. As I look at this larger uh, situation, and we've talked a bit about the black church and what the black church has been able to do, uh, but the white church, a church that, that has talked about it's being built upon notions of forgiveness and grace, uh, has been fundamental in the establishment of this particular system that demonstrates anything but forgiveness and grace. Comment a little bit about the larger theological milieu in America that has sort of perpetuated this, this notion and that continues to influence the black church. I'd like to talk about what I'm, I'm reading now that I'm really excited about. Uh, and it is, um, you know, I'm very fascinated by the work of uh, African political science and historian Akil Mbembe. You know, he does the framework of necropolitics uh, and questions the notion of, of what is rational and what is reasonable, you know, with the idea that, you know, in, in a black body, that is considered aberrant. Are you ever truly reasonable or rational within the context of the society that you're in? But um, but his work currently is looking at this framework of um, negative messianism, and I'm saying this because of the of this whole white evangelical movement that has wrapped around um, this this current president and his administration. And one of the things that he talked about was the detachment um, of the notion that redemption is built on the redeeming of the enslaved one. And so, you know, the, the fact that, that the more we drive a society where um, evangelicalism, and I'm not even going to say whiteness, the, the way in which white evangelicalism that is sometimes now practiced by black churches are moving towards this really hypersensitive, you know, this hyperized notion of killing that is not about, you know, this, as you had mentioned, Ms. Linda, the cost that you are prepared to make for justice, but the, the mere fact that you can be called to kill you know, by this Messiah body that you have thrown yourself completely, you know, in abeyance to is a dangerous, dangerous direction that many of many of these churches are going in. And, and it requires us, I think, as people of deep faith, as people that um, that are, are bound to to you know the depth of our faith by by God and this man that we call Jesus it is requiring us to be deeply engaged and deeply you know moved to do something that recaptures what we know our our faith to call us to be because what is being moved now is actually dangerous for society and um and I I think we we can't we can't afford as a people, as a collective beloved community, we cannot afford to allow for these kinds of, you know, um, otherings to occur and for the notion of the Messiah to be delinked from the Jesus movement that was about how do we get into beloved, reconciled relationship with each other. And I think that that we're we're in danger of that. That's good, Dr. Sinclair. Um, and and that that was that helps frame my thinking because I often 
uh, am troubled by notions of forgiveness because it often comes with cheap grace, right? Um, and so forgiveness is also often seen as an individual act, right? Um, and I think that, I think, uh, I think that there also has to be this reconciliation that takes place on a systemic level. How do we repair, restore, and strengthen communities um, so that whatever the infraction is, um, is is managed at the root cause, right? And not and not the manifestation. So uh, what I mean is, is that there has to be, um, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm careful in this statement because I also wanna be mindful of people who are harmed uh, by intercommunal violence and other and other forms of violence. I think it's important and it's an, it's an important act for for people who are harmed, for victims, uh, to feel that they get uh, some kind of acknowledgement of the harm caused. And I, I think that's an important process and I wanna be sensitive to that. Um, but I also caution us uh, to view forgiveness as an individual act solely, that there also has to be a repairing that happens at a systemic level. And I, I support that theologically when I think about Jesus, right? I think about Jesus on the cross and he extends penitence, uh, forgiveness to a penitent thief, right? Uh, Jesus on the cross for, uh, extends forgiveness to a penitent thief. Um, I would argue in that moment, Jesus does not see a criminal. Jesus sees someone who is restored into the image of God, someone who is worthy. Yes. But Jesus does not only extend forgiveness as an individual act, but Jesus also, by transcending criminality on the cross, causes a radical reordering of society, right? There's a social element too that happens where uh, society um, can no longer function as the old order, where the yeah. last become first and the fools shame the wise, right? And so I think when we think about forgiveness, we have to consider the assumptions it makes um, that points fingers uh, and blame Mm -hmm. um, that re-inscribes this notion of sinfulness, uh, crime, punishment, deviance. It reinforces that. So how can we rethink forgiveness beyond the individual act, though that's also important, but also with a social gesture that results in a reconciliation of the beloved community? Thank you. And let me Here's a good one, though. This, so if we're going all the way there, that means that we also have to figure out how Mitch McConnell re-enters community. Mm. That's a tough mm. one, but it requires Amen. that. But you know, that's excellent because Woo! I also think about that and say, not only Mitch McConnell, but what about Trump? I know I'm not quite there yet, I know, yes. but <laughs> You know, because- um, But you're right. Yeah. You, what you said is excellent, excellent in that what Jesus did on the cross was, first of all, saw this is a child of God. This yeah. is this is what's important. This, yeah. this is value because it just goes back to you saying you're more than enough. You are enough. I, I just, uh, that's, that was excellent. Thank Amen. you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you thank you. Thank you. I want to say thank you tonight to all of our guests. Uh, Reverend Dr. Charlene Sinclair, Reverend Dr. Nakia Smith-Robert, I'm so grateful for you, and soon to be Reverend Dr. Linda Fox. Uh, we're grateful to all of you for your contributions, but I'd be remiss, and I know I'm gonna go a little bit long tonight, that's fine. I'm gonna go a little bit long, because I wanna hear from each of you. Uh, give me at least two minutes of what would a more just system look like? We've talked about notions of restorative justice. We've talked about other ways of reconceiving what we think about as criminality. What would a more just system look like? I'll start with you, Reverend Nakia. Thank you. I, I love this question because it challenges us to move beyond the problem and to strategize ways to realize a more just society. Uh, in my work, I conceptualize 
the uh, notion of an abolitionist sanctuary. Um, I think that the church would uh, do well to um, assess its theologies and the ways they cause harm uh, and the ways in which it reproduces cultural logic through punitive doctrines and uh, cultures of respectability, which I mentioned that shames and uh, mm -hmm. casts judgment on those who are considered deviant. Um, and I think to, to in redressing those theologies and uh, teachings and practices, it is to replace it with uh, liberative interventions. And so my my uh, vision for abolitionist sanctuary is the church who uh, no longer subscribes to those punitive theologies and doctrines rooted in sin and sacrifice, the mm -hmm. church who has lawyers, doctors, uh, life coaches, uh, social workers, mental health professionals on hand, mm -hmm. right? Churches who have uh, rooms with um, that are policy think tanks, think tanks that are dressed with uh, clothes and suits to help individuals uh, interview for jobs. Um, I think that it is a holistic place. It 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 has vibrant murals, right? Um, the the preach word is rooted in liberation. The announcements are transformative. It talks about how they contributed to bailout funds, how they visited the imprisoned. Um, scripture is 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 biblical, but it's also black literary text, right? It's lived experiences. Um, and, and so my vision for a much more just world as a religious person begins with the church's leadership uh, mm -hmm. to to become a microcosm and to transcend that uh, by by leading the, the civic engagement in larger society. And 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 I'll end with this: uh, the way it does that, the way it takes uh, that abolitionist sanctuary and flips it mm -hmm. uh, inside out for the world is what I would say to engage in transformative justice strategies and public policies that ultimately undermines the carceral state uh, and advocate for those who are, are marginalized. Excellent, thank you so much. And thank you for being with us this evening. Uh, final words from you, uh, Reverend Fox. You know, I was just rethinking that question and I said, oh my, I wish that I could really answer that but you know to be honest i'm not there yet i don't know um there's so many things that i see and that i wish for and i hope for and so many days i'm just so overwhelmed by what i have to encounter one thing though is that right now we have the church this institution we see it as a building we see it as a institution a group I guess I would just love to see the church be the community. Let the community be the church. You know, it's just all inclusive. The community is the church. And I, I must say that right now, though, because of what I encounter on a daily basis, you know, you heard the story about the child on the beach and all the starfish have washed up on the beach and she's throwing them back and somebody comes by and says, well, you know, there's too many. You can't. You can't, you know, you're not, and the child says, well, it makes a difference to this one. Yeah. And so that's kind of where I am right now. I, I, I see so much that has to be done, but I'm looking at my years. I'm looking at what can I do now? And so now I, I must tell you, I've just been concentrating on one at a time, just on the one and saying, oh gosh, I wish I could do more, but it'll make a difference for this one. Yeah. It'll make a difference for this one. And then maybe this one, would be have the impetus to do that great thing that I'm not able to do. This is what many of women, Hebrews 11, some of them died in the faith. Well, I may be one of those, but I sure want to do something that'll help some folks along. Praise God. And maybe if a bunch of other folks out there went out and got just one, then we might begin to make a dent in the larger problem. But I want to say thank you, Reverend Linda, for being with us this evening and for all that you contributed. And let me end with Dr. Reverend Dr. Sinclair. Uh, what would you do? I think when, yeah, when you said this, two things came to mind. Mm. One was the Lord's Prayer, mm. um, and as interpreted by Aubrey Hendricks, you know the the idea that I'm I am focused and grounded on a God that is not the God of this world, this imperial 
world that is devastating yeah. our people and that I can get to a place where both Trump and all of you can be in my community. Like I, I really, yeah. I want to focus on that. I want to create that kind of a beloved community where that's the, that's the marker by which I'm guiding my life. And I also thought about um, Johannes Metz's dangerous memory, you know, with the idea that, um, that we've known so much harm and that because we've known it, that it won't stop us, that we, we can do anything. Yes. That if we focus on the power of the horizon that is opened up to us by Jesus and knowing that yet we live again, that we can face anything towards that horizon. And so those are the two things that that I am focused on as I'm trying to, to work with all of you to build this new, beautiful pathway towards that horizon. Amen. Thank you. It almost sounded like you said... Uh, we need to take this faith that we say we believe seriously. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you all tonight. This was such a brilliant panel of not just distinguished scholars, but scholar activists who put their lives where their scholarship is. And I'm so grateful to each of you for joining us tonight. I'm grateful for all of you who come and listen to this conversation tonight. Those of you who've contributed questions and uh, raised concerns that have come in the chat, we've been, uh, hopefully you've heard your questions reflected back and forth, even to some of the ones that I did not call out, the, the questions were, were percolating. Uh, we will be joined again. Uh, we'll be joining us again next month. We will have another Just Talk, Talk Just. And I'm going to turn it over to our uh, The Voice, uh, uh, Mike Frontiero, to close us out this evening. Thank you all for being with us. God bless you and look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Dr. Sadler. And thank you for watching. If you registered for the forum, Please share your thoughts by taking a two-minute survey that will be emailed to you at the end of the broadcast. Please join us again for our next panel discussion on Civil Rights Movements and Black Lives Matter Across Generations and Genders. This webinar will be Tuesday, January 19th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Watch your email for registration. We hope you'll join us then. Have a great day.